Hey everyone, I'm Shane Hennessy, and in this video I'm going to be talking about how to arrange music for solo guitar. This video is an example of a series of lessons that I would do over on my Truefire channel, the Fretboard Atlas. So if you're interested in more videos like this, make sure you check out the Fretboard Atlas over on Truefire.com. So, um, arranging for solo guitar can be a, a little bit tricky at times. We have to take into account that the guitar has a somewhat limited frequency range on its own. Um, we can change this by effects and you know octave pedals and stuff like that, but as it is, um, we have to deal with the fact that we can only usually produce a maximum of about six notes, and certain things the guitar is good at, certain things the guitar is not good at. So I'm going to give you my top three tips for arranging for solo guitar, and hopefully these tips will be able to help you when you're arranging for the guitar. So tip number one is probably the most important one I'm gonna give you. Tip number one is establish the groove of the song that you're playing as soon as possible. What I mean by this is, if you have a song that is, for example, like one of my tunes, Avenue, at the very start of that song, I play my intro and I go straight into the groove and I state it as clearly as possible. So after I do my harmonic intro, I end up on. You know, I'm straight into the groove there. The reason I do this is because when you establish a groove really well, the groove continues in your listener's head, whether they realize it or not, and even whether you realize it or not. When I play a groove that's that strong and people get into that groove, you can then remove things from it in a very um, sort of a, a subtle way without their feeling like anything is missing. So for example, to use that tune Avenue as an example, as soon as I go into the melody, There's a whole three melody notes there where it's just, you know, the melody on its own. There's no backing or accompaniment behind it, but you don't miss it because I've already established that groove so clearly. I learned this from listening to a Bobby McFerrin workshop. Bobby McFerrin um, uses just his voice to create most of his music. So he has to be very particular about when he chooses, say, a high note or a low note or a percussive thing. And as I listen to him talking about feeding people just enough information to keep the groove going, I applied that to my own arranging as well. So a lot of my own guitar arrangements, you'll find that I state the groove very clearly and very sort of heavily. I lay it on thick at the start and then I can afford to start taking things away and moving in a new direction because I've put down the foundation so well at the beginning. And this goes for anything, any kind of song or tune, whatever you're playing on the guitar. To be honest, it goes even outside of the solo guitar arrangement world. If you're playing with another musician, say, and you're kind of taking a prominent role as the guitar player, you should always aim to state that groove as clearly as possible. If you listen to any of the uh, Chic recordings, any of the stuff that Bernard Edwards and Nile Rodgers made, the chorus is almost always at the very start. They have like a very quick drum intro and they're straight into the chorus. And that's because it drills in the core groove of the song into the listener immediately. So of course the fundamental parts of any groove are the rhythm, whatever rhythm you're putting down, the bass line, um, any of the accompanying parts that go with it, and maybe the melody line as well, depending on the song or tune that you're doing. But what you want to do ideally is to state all of those lines clearly at the start. Um, don't diverge too much if you're doing an arrangement of somebody else's um, composition. Uh, you want to play the melody the way that the composer wrote it, or in other words, the way that most people would recognize it, say if you whistled it or if you were humming the tune. And this brings me on nicely to point number two, which is know the melody exactly as the composer wrote it. What I mean by that is, if there's a melody in a song that sits a particular way with the beat or with the groove behind it, you want to make sure that you are playing the melody the same way that it was written and the same way it's played and the same way that most people would interpret it and understand it. In other words, if you asked someone else to hum or sing the song, that what you're playing is going to be the same as that because that's the most recognizable part. 
the big um, or the most common issue that I would see with guitar players when they're arranging is that sometimes they'll come across a particular maybe melodic move or a position change or something like that and because it's difficult they might opt to maybe delay it a bit or you know bring it forwards ahead of the beat a bit or behind the beat or they might opt to just play it in a different register or something like that you want to avoid that as much as possible. You want to get the melody as close to the original as possible. The other thing I see happening a lot as well is that sometimes because, again, of maybe a position that you're in or having to use your little finger to, to you know, get a melody note or to make a particular movement, it's very easy to forget that the melody is the most important thing. You know, you can play a melody for somebody and they will instantly recognize the song. Whereas if you play a groove or a rhythm or something like that, it's not instantly as recognizable. People latch on to melodies really quickly. So the hierarchy of what is important when you're arranging um, has melody at the top all the time. The melody is the most important part. For me then below that is the bass line because the bass line usually kind of gives you enough harmonic information along with the melody to kind of imply what the chord is. So I would always choose a melody first and then a bass note or a bass line. And then I would look at everything else in terms of, you know, a backbeat or extra parts of a chord or anything like that. If I come to a position, you know, something that happens to me quite often is that if I'm arranging a tune and I'll come across somewhere where I have to play a bass note and a percussive hit at the same time. Sometimes it's it's not possible to get it clean, sometimes it's just not possible to do. And in those situations, I'll always prioritize hitting the bass note instead of the backbeat. Because again, as I mentioned in the first point, when you establish a groove, you can take out, um, say, like a backbeat or something like that and bring it back in and you don't feel like you're missing anything from the arrangement. Another important thing that goes along with this point is to identify all of the salient features in a piece of music and all the places where the dynamics change. So what I mean by that is, if there's a particular part in a piece of music that is instantly recognizable, that isn't, say, the melody or the bass or whatever, but it might be like a fill-in part that's really important to get, you have to make sure to include that in your arrangement as well. And the kind of the, the rule of thumb here is that if you would sing it or hum it, you know, as you are trying to recreate this tune with just your voice, it's important enough to put it in if you would sing it or hum it. For example, off the top of my head, if I think of um, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, right, by Michael Jackson, you have that um, horn line that goes... Da -da 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 now that to me, even though it's only like two seconds of music that happens in it, that would be important for me to put into an arrangement because it's a noticeable thing in that song. It's a noticeable hook or a noticeable feature. So any, any song that you listen to like that, while you always want to give priority to the melody, there are little bits like that that usually come in either below the melody or separate to the melody. Those are important to get those in as well because they're the recognizable parts of a song. So this brings me on to my third point. And my third point is that you should always try to play to the guitar's strengths as much as possible. What I mean by that is the guitar is good at, say, you know, short repeated notes. Um, it's good at going up through, you know, octaves and arpeggios and things like that. Um, so it does that well. It doesn't do sustain overly well uh, all the time. So you might end up using like a long reverb or a freeze pedal or something if you want a piece that sustains an awful lot. Um, and it sounds the best usually when there are a lot of chord changes and a lot of melodic changes involved. So for example, if you were looking at a lot of kind of modern pop songs, at least what I'm hearing uh, kind of generally on the radio and on Spotify playlists and stuff like that, you have a lot of melodies that tend to stay in the same area. So you've got like uh, countless songs that just sound like... Okay, so that doesn't really, like a melody that's like that might work for say like an Ed Sheeran song but it doesn't necessarily work too well for the guitar because there's not really a huge amount of movement there. Whereas an arrangement sounds really good if you're able to bring a lot of different chords uh, into the mix as well. So there are two things to look out for here. One is if you can find a song that has a lot of chord changes and melodies that kind of move up and down and kind of don't just stay in the one place, they will generally suit uh, the guitar uh, arrangement, uh, the solo guitar approach quite well. 
um, and also say songs that have particular uh, say riffs in the bass or in the guitar line or the keyboard line or whatever what comes to mind is say my arrangement of you can call me Al that has a really prominent bass line and it's also got that really prominent um, kind of synth horn sound so that's like an ideal candidate for a guitar arrangement because they're really defined parts. The second thing then is you can also introduce your own ideas such as, you know, say changes to the harmony or changes to like may maybe like the rhythm in places or stuff like that as well um, and dynamic changes as well. So using things like guitar harmonics, um, be they, you know, kind of natural harmonics or artificial harmonics. Um, you can, you know, use the to what the guitar is good at, essentially. If a song doesn't have a huge amount of movement, or if you find that your arrangement is getting to a point where maybe it feels a little bit stale or a little bit samey in places, you can always choose to maybe change the chords to kind of reharmonize what's going on to make it move more or to put in rhythmic changes. What comes to mind straight away for me is um, in my arrangement of American Patrol, um, there's a part that goes, it normally goes like this. And then the second time that comes around in the song, I wanted that to sound a bit different. So instead of just playing it the same way again, I split each chord into triplets. So whereas the first time was... The second time is... that so go bump 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 like that it's like a triplet movement with my fingers um, and things like that are good to kind of just give an extra bit of kind of pop or a bit of kind of wow factor to a, a guitar arrangement that needs a, a little bit of a lift in a particular place and it might help as well to think maybe more like somebody who isn't a musician you want to keep your listeners ears engaged all the time so um, in more technical language, you don't want to be hanging around in the same frequency range all the time. If you have a guitar arrangement that is like full on from the very start, that can get boring very, very quickly. And an awful lot of arrangements that use a lot of guitar percussion at the start, they're amazing for like the first 15 seconds. But the issue is that um, as players, we can get carried away with how technical something is and how it feels. But as a listener, uh, we're not taking into account that the frequency range that we're occupying is literally as much as we can occupy. So the only way to go from there is down. So unless we kind of take away a lot of, you know, the frequency range that we're actually using, as in not hitting the bass and the trebles and the mid range and all the percussive stuff at the same time, we just have to be really careful about that. If we're starting off, you know, hard in an arrangement, we want to make sure that we still have somewhere to go, that we're not backed into a corner. And when I say think like somebody who isn't a musician, think about maybe, you know, somebody who is, uh, you know, listening to a solo guitar piece for the first time. If you want to keep them engaged, you want to, in the same way, say, as a band would in a live show, you want to have parts that are loud and big, you want to have parts that are quiet and soft, you want to have parts that feel like a bit humorous or kind of jokey, um, you might want to have parts that are kind of more reflective and deep. And again, this all comes down to mostly to kind of personal taste and also suiting the vibe of a song. But what's important to remember is, no matter what we're doing, we're still kind of limited to a certain dynamic range. And we have to be aware that we're not kind of overusing one particular section of it as well. So with all of that in mind, I'd like to bring you through my arrangement of American Patrol, uh, which is a tune uh, that I learned from the Glenn Miller recordings, but it's in the public domain. So I'm able to play the whole thing uh, for you and um, kind of break it down. So uh, I'm going to do this uh, not necessarily section by section, but maybe feature by feature or area by area. So let's take a look at American Patrol. So the first point I made about establishing the groove is valid uh, for this arrangement as well. When I begin the tune, uh, at least in the live version, I usually go... So that gets straight in there with 
Okay, and coming in strong with that. Um, and I'm not kind of putting in any additional kind of extras or features or anything at that moment because I want kind of the listeners to get into the groove of listening to bam, 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 da, 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 and establishing it really clearly. So then my second point was about knowing the melody as it was written or as it was, it was kind of commonly known. And uh, it's the same for this arrangement. I keep it dead straight and I keep it exactly the way uh, it is on the recordings that I know of it. Okay, so I'm not kind of diverting from the melody there. I'm stating it very clearly, keeping the groove straight as well. So then my point about salient features or about like the specifics of the song that are recognizable. Um, there's a piece in what I would think of as the C section of this song where it goes da da bum 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 like that. So when you listen to the original recording of American Patrol, you hear the trumpets on their own, ba -da, and then the rest of the band comes in. Now it might be tempting here to just play like this as a bass line or to play it just kind of and that's sort of, to me, it's, it's fine, but it doesn't really move and it doesn't really feel like it doesn't have the spirit of the original recording. So for me, it was important when I heard those da -da -da -da, those stabs to work out those chords and find out the voicings. And they're not the most friendly to play, but they do kind of invoke the spirit of that Glenn Miller recording. So with the melody throughout American Patrol, parts of it are um, kind of monophonic, as in the melody is just on its own, and then parts of it are harmonized as well. So I am conscious that in the parts in the recording that are harmonized, to try as much as possible to bring in harmony with those melody lines as well. So for example, um, there's in the, what I would think of as the D section, uh, you've got this. That's all kind of, at least to my ear, that's da, da, da. the movement is all below it. So it's not particularly like a, a direct harmony. Now this changes here. So again, I went over this uh, recording and um, I worked out to find out exactly which way the chords were moving because to me it's a salient feature. It's a really important feature of that song that that part is because if I did it on its own it would be more something like a... Um, like, uh, Which is not bad, but it has more character in it when you play. Like that. It's just, it feels more like the original. So then sometimes there are things that we can do, say, with our guitar technique that can help to kind of change the dynamic mood of a song. So the part that I'm thinking about here is um, when the melody comes in um, from. Uh, I can't think of the name of the tune, but in the middle of American Patrol it goes. <laughs> Sounds like, not like, I think it's like The Girl I Left Behind or, or one of those tunes. Um, or The Rare Old Mountain Dew or something like that. But um, for that section I was having, you know, difficulty trying to come up here and go. <laughs> and then... Uh, you know, that didn't really feel right given what I just played. So to change the dynamics of it a little bit more, I decided to put the melody down an octave from where I was. Like that. And then do the opposite of what I was doing in the thumb by playing that part with my fingers instead. So the fingers are now coming in off the beat. So if the beat is like one, two, three, four, it's going one, two, three, four, one to coming in like that. So this took a little bit of getting used to, but when I play it now, I go. You 
you know so that that takes up a sort of a different sort of frequency range it is our ears hear that differently because we haven't heard that kind of light sort of bouncy information in the arrangement yet and also we haven't heard a low melody line with a higher accompanying part and there are some more subtleties i put into that as well so for example um in the part that goes um what you may or may not notice is that for this part and only this part my thumb goes from sort of an alternating bass pattern to then a more sort of a chugging bass pattern. So in finger or in thumb picking language, this is more like a Chet Atkins way of doing things. And then the next chord, this D that I play, I kind of chug on the sixth and fifth strings and then the fourth and third strings. So it goes. That's kind of the more Merle Travis way of thumb picking. And again, the reason I do this is it's a subtle change, but it's, it's more in keeping with what I hear on the Glenn Miller recording. When I come up to that section in the Glenn Miller, you hear bam 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 ba da da ba ba da bam bam. Okay, so those are kind of salient pieces. And in order to just make the the that a bit more prominent, I I kind of make the bass a bit dirtier, so that when I play the bass line, it stands out more. And a lot of guitar arranging is kind of doing these techniques in order to get pieces that you're playing to feel more different or to stand out more than what you've just played before. In other words, getting things to be as defined as possible. Another salient feature for me is the A section variation at the end of the tune. So in other words, when I come back off the... Um section so it's very similar to the first section but obviously slightly different melody notes uh, slightly different little kind of slight differences in harmony and things like that are important because not only in the original arrangement do they kind of create more movement but in our arrangement it creates more movement as well so a section that I had to come up with something creative for uh, is the section that links uh, this part into this uh, because in the middle of that, in the original recording, it's just like a drum um, and there's nothing else going on behind it. So I can't just stop the arrangement and start going, you know, it doesn't suit the vibe of a solo guitar arrangement, definitely. Um, so what I do instead is uh, I imitate the drum pattern by holding on this A bass note. And in, at least in the live versions, I also add in a couple of percussive taps with that as well. So I come out of... And it continues on from there. And that, again, is just a little break for our listeners' ears. You know, we reduce the frequency range right down to just a note kind of going quickly and all of a sudden we bring in these percussive taps that are just kind of new and unintrusive enough that they kind of capture people's attention but we instantly go away from them and that's what makes a piece uh, you know a, a, a kind of for me that's what defines a salient piece in that it appears it's interesting it goes away and something else happens as I mentioned earlier in the video there's that section as well where I usually have those um, <laughs> those chords um, and the triplets kind of replace them the second time around. And again, that is something that is just kind of happens quickly. It grabs your listener's ear and then it's gone again. So I don't stay on something like that for a long time. I kind of, I always revert back to kind of getting back into that initial groove and then bringing people a different direction and bringing them back to the groove. It's nearly like a yo-yo between, you know, the groove as it is defined by you at the start, bringing people out of that, out of the comfort zone and bringing them back and kind of feeding them a bit more, um, you know, interesting musical features.
And then even the very final piece that I play in the outro sounds uh, um, like... <coughs> that even that last thing you know you hear all this climbing you know your listeners hearing a climb they're not necessarily hearing every chord individually they hear uh, like it's a roller coaster that kind of thing it's going upwards and it reaches the apex and I just really focus on those top three and then for that very final note the dynamic is totally different that's really soft the bottom one is you know, I'm getting my thumb right underneath that string to just kind of pop it out as a real kind of bang, we're finished. And so that for me, you know, all of those small things that I spoke about, for me, that's what makes up an interesting guitar arrangement. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, video about a little kind of window into how I arrange for the guitar. I hope you enjoyed the tips at the start and also the breakdown of American Patrol. If you liked it, leave a comment below, let me know what you think. And as I said uh, earlier on, if you want to see more stuff like this, my Truefire channel, the Fretboard Atlas, is about to go live on Truefire.com. I'd love to see you sign up over there because we're going to be covering an awful lot of material similar to this over on the channel. The new videos every single week, and I'm going to be very active in the community there, um, you know, learning stuff from my students as much as my students are going to learn from me. So make sure to check out the Fretboard Atlas on Truefire.com. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you again soon.